to do to finish Sabrio is we'll get as far as we can through it today. Um, and then I'll send you a link or two to a couple of video lectures to complete it so that we can get back on track when we come back from spring break. So when we come back from spring break, we're going to start Lyriel. All right. Um, I would say because I've got it divided into four days, have a fourth of it read. Uh, we will not have the quiz on the second day. We'll probably have the quiz that Friday when we come back. So it'll be before we finish discussing um, the entire novel, but the quiz may, as all each of the other quizzes have been, the quiz may cover the entire novel. Okay. I want to pick up, <clears throat> we talked kind of generally about the, the background world, so to speak. Um, I want to pick up with, after Sabriel sees the sending, and the sending gives her the necromancer's bells, there are seven bells, and the sword, okay? And she knows, she realizes, well, let me, hmm, I don't want to put because she has the bells and sword, what should she know? He doesn't have them. He doesn't have them, which means he's dead. Okay. Why? Because when one ab person dies, the bells and the sword go to the next ab person, the next person in line. Okay. So she receives them. Her father's dead, but. Because she is the, prior to that happening, the ab horse in training, okay? She's had to read a book, and she's kind of had to train. She's had to prepare for becoming ab horse. Um, so she's had to go into death before. And we talked about, you know, death isn't merely an event. It's a process. It's a process that takes time. You have to go through all nine gates, okay? So, even though her receiving the bells and the sword should mean her father's dead, what does she believe? He's not all the way dead. Exactly. She can bring, he, she can bring him back. So, she decides to head north. Now, about where is she at this point? If we were to put the map up here, the old kingdom, Anchelstee here, and there's a border between them called the Old Wall. Where is she in relation to, let's say, that old wall? Yeah, she's pretty close. She's not way down here in southern Anchelstier, which is where the capital city is. Okay? She's pretty close. What happens the closer you get to the wall? What happens, for example, to electricity? Flickers, it goes on and off. Why? Well, once you go across the wall and you're in the old kingdom, you don't have any modern technology. Or what we think of as modern technology. Electricity doesn't work, for example. Telephones wouldn't work north of there. Airplanes wouldn't fly north of there. So the closer you get to the wall in the old kingdom, the closer you get to where kind of what Hold sway. Take a guess, Bill. Magic. Magic. Okay. And Angel Steer. A N C A N C E L S T I E R R E. No magic. This is like our world, right? In the old kingdom. Magic. Magic has two kinds, though, right? You have the charter, as we talked about, and you have free magic. 
The charter is bound magic because the charter itself is some kind of... I've been reading this thing for a dozen years and I still don't know exactly know how to describe it. It's some kind of governing principle or rule or structure that magic should be connected to. And yet there is also free magic, unbound, ungoverned, unstructured. And there are what are called free magic beings, that is, beings of pure magic, let's say, that aren't connected to the charter. They can be bound by the charter. They can be put under the control of the charter. But in and of themselves, they're away from it. And I, I will kind of add, add this. At some point, at the, I don't know, beginning of time or whatever, the charter is kind of made of free magic beings. That is, they kind of unite to build the charter and they build some other things too, which is part of the process of discovery in the novels that we'll talk about. Okay, So, she decides to leave Wiverly College, where she's a student, and she's going to go up to the north to the Old Kingdom. Why? She knows that's where her father is. That's what the, the ab horse kind of walks around, moves around, maybe flies around, in the Old Kingdom, finding dead things that won't stay dead. I mean, this is a literal kind of job description. Finding dead things that won't stay dead and make them go past the Ninth Gate. Send them on to death. Not as punishment. It's release. See, if you're only partially dead or mostly dead, that means you're still bound. Okay? But your, call it what you want, life force, soul, spirit, that can be used by other necromancers, people who raise the dead, for nefarious slash evil purposes, okay? Think like the cauldron born. The cauldron born are guys who should be dead. They get thrown in the cauldron to come back out, and notice, when they come back out of the cauldron, what kind of will do they have? None. Shall we shake hands? None. They have none. Their will is whatever the master of the cauldron's will is, okay? So, she heads north. She gets to the old wall. Now, is the old wall merely an old crumbling wall that you can climb up and over? No. What is it on the south side? Or what do you see on the south side of the wall before you get to the actual wall? Defenses. What kind? What are the defenses for? There has dual purpose. Keep people in ancestral. Yeah. That's right. To keep these people here and to keep those people there. It's kind of like the DMZ between North Korea and South Korea today. You know, the demilitarized zone. You've got a space of land that's almost literally a no man's land. You don't step in that DMZ, okay, unless you're very high ranking or you're stationed there. So she goes up and she runs into the troops, okay, she gets off the bus, she starts to kind of make her way towards the wall. And a soldier stops her, pages 36, 37, and demands her papers. And she says, I'm a citizen of the old kingdom. And notice we're told, page 37, she says that kind of quietly. She doesn't yell out, I'm a citizen of up here, which means, I mean, it actually means this, she can come and go. She's a citizen of the old kingdom. She doesn't have or doesn't need papers from down here. Papers are what kind of government, what kind of society demands that you carry papers on you? Papers meaning form of identification, telling an authority who you are, where you live, what you do, etc. In the United States, do you have to have quote unquote papers? To just be walking down the street? No, you don't. You don't have to walk around with an ID. 
If you are walking down the street and a cop demands to see your license, and you go, I'm not driving, you don't have to turn over a license, especially if you don't have one, right? In Eastern, in East Germany, however, when there was an East Germany, or in Soviet Russia, you did have to carry all the time on your person identification. Why? Because you were insignificant. It's the government that was all important. That's how it is here. Okay? So, she just says, I'm a citizen of the old kingdom. And I'm returning there. Yes? Well, I mean, when I said the old king, the old kingdom citizens can move freely. A couple of things. One, most of them don't want to go down here. Why? Because this is like going from try to get a good example. This is like going from I don't. I've never been there, but I've had family been there. Hawaii to Antarctica. Not weather-wise, but you know, a lot of people would say, Hawaii, man, that sounds like paradise. Antarctica, not so much, okay? Why? There's a lot of freedom here. You don't have the government breathing down your shoulder. You do what you want. There's magic, you know. If you're a charter mage, you can do things with magic. And a lot of people are charter mages, varying levels. Think of, you know, educational level kind of a thing. But down here, it's everyday, ordinary, humdrum. If you've read the Harry Potter novels, this is like the Harry Potter world, and this is our world, the muggle world. Okay? It's a bit more interesting up here. So the, the border area, while they can come through and then return back home, and they're supposed to be able to do that without obstruction, okay? the border area is primarily to stop those down here from going up there. Not, um, well, let me put it into a question. Why? Why would you want to stop, say you're the government down here, why would you want to stop people from down here going up there? This is where the government is actually, quote unquote, good, let's say. It's for their own protection. How many of you are familiar loosely with the Harry Potter stories? Seen the films, read some of the books. Okay. What would happen if an everyday ordinary muggle wanders into Hogsmeade or Hogwarts or the Wizarding World? You know, not enough duct tape in the world to keep your head together. You'd be just amazed. You'd see people flying on brooms. You'd see people apparating left and right. You'd see all kind of stuff. You'd see animorphs, you know, people changing from one thing into another, changing their hair color merely by thinking about it. It would do what? It'd blow, it'd blow your mind. Imagine that suddenly today, in our world, you're walking down the street, you see somebody, and you're watching, you're following that person, and they poof, disappear right in front of your eyes. What would the first thing you come to your mind? I'm losing it. I'm going crazy. Okay? So it's to protect them. Because, again, there's no magic down here. But the closer you get to the wall, the more and more you feel the effects of magic, the force of magic. That's why electricity, right at the wall itself, doesn't work. If you have an electric watch, and you're going across the wall, and you pass through the archway of the wall, it stops. Right when you go through. Okay. So, she tries just saying, I'm a citizen of the old kingdom. Papers. And then he says, hmm. Sabriel gives a frosty smile, and she makes a movement with the 
tips of her fingers. Notice we're told it's a ritual movement. The implication there is, well, we're told it's a symbol of disclosing of things hidden, becoming seen, of unfolding. As her fingers sketch, she formed the symbol in her mind, linking it with the papers. So if this were the Harry Potter world, this would be kind of a nonverbal spell. She does something with her fingers, and she thinks a spell at the same time. This is kind of like Obi-Wan Kenobi's, these are not the droids you're searching for. And the two stormtroopers go, these aren't the droids we're looking for, and they let them on past. Okay. So, she shows the guy, essentially paper, and he thinks it's fine. And she starts to weave another charter mark to take the papers back out of his hands. And suddenly, she's surrounded by people. And now, these people that she's surrounded by aren't merely Anchel Steer and soldiers. Some of them are also charter mages. That is, they know the magic. They can practice some of the magic. Kind of a dangerous situation. Until a corporal comes in and stops everybody. Okay. Well, excuse me, until a major comes in, stops everybody. And this other man comes up to her, and we're told, trying to see where to pick up, page 40. He takes the passport, tucks it in his belt, tilts his helmet back with two fingers. Reveals a charter mark on his forehead. The charter mark is up here. Okay. Still glowing. Sabriel lifts her hand in with two fingers. She touches it. Why? She's making sure it's a real charter mark because there can be false charter marks. See, if you're a charter mage, that means, you know, it's kind of like at the beginning of the novel when they baptize Sabriel. And they put the mark with ash, kind of like, you know, for Catholics, Ash Wednesday is coming up. Okay. They put the charter mark, and if the baptism takes, it then disappears into the skin. But if you come up to another charter mage, and they do a little bit of magic, it makes the charter mark reappear. You go and you touch each, other, each other's charter mark to prove. Real mage, real mage. Because if they're a charter mage... That is always, it's good. Okay. Charter mages don't, quote unquote, use charter magic for bad. Okay. So, she proves he's good, he proves she's good. And he says, page 41, an unsullied charter mark. She is no creature or sending. See, because the other charter mages, when they come around, they think maybe she is exactly the same kind of thing that showed up at Wiverly College. Not real flesh and blood. Okay? So, he says to her, so you're the daughter, page 41, top of 42, you're the daughter of Abhorson. Notice he doesn't say daughter of the Abhorson. Abhorson is like a name. It's a title, too. Okay. He tells her who he is. She says, you know, we're some Edgel Steerans who've managed to gain a charter mark and a little bit of knowledge of magic. Now, why does Colonel Horace and some of these other soldiers, why have they gained a little bit of knowledge of magic and a charter mark? Because of where they live and work, right at the border. If you were to go 100 miles south, no. They wouldn't then have a knowledge of magic or be able to become minimal mages of, so of sorts. Okay? So they talk. He says, you crossing, crossing over. She says, yes. Is that person or someone coming to meet you? And she says, did you know my father? Notice, did do, middle of 43. Did implies can't anymore. <laughs> He's gone. 
do, still present tense. And he says, yes, I knew your father. I saw him, etc. He says, you're a necromancer. That's, except for the ab person, that's really never good. Raising the dead is not a, a positive attribute. Okay? So, Horus says, 44, when I arrived, that is, when I became kind of commander here, the trouble was just beginning. What trouble? Corpses wouldn't stay dead. Our people or old kingdom creatures. So, here's the wall. Dead people here wouldn't stay dead. The dead, whatever they were, up here wouldn't stay dead. Soldiers killed the day before would turn up on parade. Creatures prevented from crossing would rise up. And he talks about what Abhorson did to stop that. Okay. He creates what are called these wind flutes. And Sabriel says, those flutes will continue working. That is, the dead now, they will stay dead. But they'll only stay dead until when? Louder? Okay. When will the magic tie be gone? When Abhorson, the one who built them, is fully dead the next full moon. So once he dies, when the next full moon comes, those wind flutes will no longer work. So, she knows what? He's in death now. He's not fully dead. He's not gone past that ninth gate. Okay? So, because he's in death, but not yet fully dead, that means everybody here, they're in danger. Because once he's fully gone, Those wind flutes no longer work, and all those dead down here, and all those dead up here, they're going to come back. So what does that tell us? She now kind of has two jobs to do, right? One, she thinks she needs to save her father. Two, if she can't save her father, and she does become the full abhorson, then she's got to take care of this problem. She's only 18. Okay? She says, page 47, he's trapped in death, or he may even be dead, and his bindings will be broken. And that's when Horace says, whoa, 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 what do you mean? <laughs> and she explains, the flutes play a song only heard in death, continuing a binding laid down by Abhorson. The bound are tied to him, the flutes will have no power, but if he's now among the dead, they will bind no more. Now, when she says, if he is now among the dead, she doesn't mean, I misspoke earlier, she doesn't mean past the ninth gate. She means he's in, let's call it, the process of death. So, next full moon, even if he's in the process of death, that power is gone. That binding power is gone and the dead will rise. Okay? So, she and Horace continue talking, and she says, I'm going to go, and I'm going to try and bring him back. And Horace tells us, page 51, so the full moon, that's, that's in 14 days. That's two weeks' time. If he's dead, or in the process of death, we've got two weeks until, kind of literally, all hell breaks loose. The dead arise. She says, yeah, I could maybe buy in the dead anew, have it done on this sort of scale, but I know how. Why? Because she's read the Book of the Dead. She says, but before I can do that, i got to get to his house. i got to check some things. Okay. So, he shows her a map, and on the map, page 54, he shows her a charter stone. 
and says, or part of one. Why? Somebody broke it. How do you break a charter stone? Who? Um, not necessarily an app person. A mage, a charter mage. Sacrifice a charter mage on it, and that will break the stone. Okay? So, they keep talking, and Sabriel says, page 56, because Horus tells her, I have a daughter almost your age. I would not let her cross into the old kingdom. Okay, but bear in mind, his daughter's Angel Stierin, she's old kingdom. But Sabriel says, I'm only 18 years old on the outside. That is, physically looking at me, I'm only 18. She doesn't mean, you know, internally I'm ageless, I'm 100 or whatever. No. She says, but I first walked in death when I was 12. So six years ago was the first time she went into the process of death. Doesn't mean she had to die. Abhorsons and necromancers can go into death. Right? By using magic. So, she says, I encountered a fifth gate rester when I was 14. That is, somebody at the fifth gate. So, that's like halfway through the process. Banished it beyond the ninth gate. So, she's actually sent something all the way through. When I was 16, I stalked and banished a mordicant that came near the school. It was a week in Mordecant, and we're going to find out later. Mordecants are pretty powerful, dead creatures. They're not free magic beings, but they are things that have been alive, usually people, but because they've been dead for so long, when they come back, when a necromancer brings them out of death, you can't really tell them for what they were. We would call it like a monster, okay? And she says, and a year ago, I turned the final page of the Book of the Dead. That is, I finally read the whole thing. I don't feel young anymore. I look 18. Inside, psh, she's seen a lot. This is like an 18-year-old who grows up in a war-torn society and sees death day in and day out for 12 years. Colonel, I am sorry for that. Why? Because how should an 18-year-old be looking on life? With hope, with joy, with opportunity, possibilities. And she's just looking at it as, I got to go put that person dead. I got to go make that thing die, et cetera, et cetera. He says, I mean, I wish you some of the foolish joys my daughter has. Some of the lightness, the lack of responsibility that goes with youth. What, what does he mean, the lack of responsibility? She's 18. Now, she's finished what is called here college. You guys are all in college. So it's a little bit different. You're a little bit older than she is. But what is supposedly one of the things that's supposed to happen in college? And I don't mean what we're doing here right now. I mean learning. What else is supposed to happen? I mean, is it supposed to be totally only all about books? No. Why not? You can join sororities or fraternities. And why do you join a sorority or a fraternity? Fun. College is supposed to be, partially at least, a period of fun. Why? Before you, quote unquote, go into the real world. Now, most of you work. Some of you work full time. So you've got that whole real world burden already. Or you're married, etc. You've got that burden already. Okay. But her idea, <laughs> or, or the idea here, that he's suggesting is, you're supposed to have this period of, you know, sucking on, as, as 
Henry David Thoreau put it, sucking all the marrow out of life, really living. And yet, even in our society today, what happens if one of you, Bill, does something really stupid in his college career? And then 30 years from now, he is elected to a high political office, and he wants to go to an even higher political office. And his opponent finds out he did something really stupid. I mean, what's going on in Virginia right now? The governor, and I'm not a Democrat, so I'm not, you know, standing up to defend this guy. But the governor, when he was, okay, a little bit older than Bill, he was 28. He was in his final year of med school. He did what? He either, according to the yearbook picture, he did one of two things. He dressed up in blackface or he put on a KKK suit, hood. Stupid, right? Really, really stupid. And, and here's the big difference. I don't know what age Bill is. I'm going to say 21. A 21 versus a 28-year-old doing that. A 21-year-old undergraduate versus a 28-year-old medical student. A medical student, you, you ought to have a little bit of wisdom. 21-year-olds, we don't generally say have much wisdom. That's why they do stupid things, okay? Smoking pot as a 21-year-old is nothing compared to smoking pot as a 51-year-old and running for president. That is currently smoking pot as a 15-year-old, a 50-year-old, okay? Or acid or coke or whatever, okay? When you're young, you're supposed to also be what? Supposed to be, my terminology, stupid. And what happens as a result of aging? You grow not only older, but wiser. Look at Taryn. Now, Taryn, obviously, he's a lot younger when the novels begin. And he's maybe 21 when the novels end. But he's a hell of a lot wiser. Horace is saying, you know, I would wish for you to be able to be the stupid girl that my daughter She's already gone past all that, right? But I don't wish it if it will weaken you in the times ahead. But I don't want you to be lighthearted <laughs> and lack responsibility. Because what are the times ahead? He's thinking two weeks. Uh, I, I'd like you to be serious. <laughs> if your father's really dead, then I want you to be dead serious. And Sabriel says, does the walker choose the path or the path the walker? Quoted the words, redolent with echoes of charter magic, twining around her tongue like some lingering spice. Those words were the dedication in the front of her almanac. They were also the very last words all alone on the last page of the Book of the Dead. Does the walker choose the path or the path the walker? Notice, if you're a walker, what must you have? You gotta have a path, a way, some you know, means to move. The question is, is it fate or is it free will? Okay. Did she choose to be Abhorson? No. That title got passed on to her, okay? Horace, what does it mean? I don't know, <laughs> Sabriel says. And he says, but when you say it, man, it's powerful. If I spoke those words, that's all they'd be, words. She says, I don't know. But there's other sayings too, and she talks about some. So she goes. And... We're told she gets to the old wall. She gets to the wall, page 61. And she sees in the stone. I don't have it in here because we got this soundproofing crap. No, she sees in the stone charter marks moving up and down. Why? Because the wall is made of charter marks. That is... The wall, 
appears to be stone. It's not actually. Just as, according to modern physics, this disk appears to be solid, right? Harder I hit it, the more my hand's going to hurt. Solid, solid. But according to physics, is that really the case? No, because how is an atom formed? You've got the nucleus, it's surrounded by electrons and protons, and what is there between the nucleus and electrons and protons? There's space. There's actually space here. But when I hit it, it's like electron to electron, proton to proton. Right? Which is why science fiction people, you know, writers and such come up with ways where you can change your structure, your cellular structure, so that you can then pass your hand through the tabletop, etc. Right? So, he says, the old kingdom welcomes you. Sabriel goes on. And we're told... She finds the first dead anchel steer and soldier about six miles from the wall. Why? She knew a platoon had gone out and hadn't returned. She sees a hand sticking out from a snowdrift. He'd been dead 12 days. No signs as to what killed him. Okay. She folds his arms across his chest. We're told 64. She draws the charter marks of fire, cleansing, peace, and sleep in the air above the corpse. We're not told what the marks look like, but notice fire, cleansing, peace, and sleep. It's kind of like four points. And I could be reading way into this, but it could also be like a cross. I mean, you have the baptismal image. We are going to have an image of a cross at the end of the novel. Okay? A very clear, strong image. And she whispers the sounds of those marks. It was a, and then he uses a religious term, a litany. What is a litany? A litany is a set of prayers. And in the church you have what are called Little litanies and great litanies. You've got little sets of prayers and then big long ones. Like a little one might be a set of prayers to, I don't know, the Virgin Mary. Okay? And then big long prayer, what's called the great litany, might be for the whole world. So you pray for leaders, you pray for individuals, you pray for good health, for good weather, all that kind of stuff. So she says a little litany that every charter mage knew and it had the usual effect. A glowing ember sparked up between the man's folded arms, multiplied into many stabbing, darting flames, and what happens? Poof! So what has she just done to this guy? She cremates his corpse, and what about the him that used to inhabit the corpse? She sent him on. She sent him on. To what? What's the last word talking about the four marks? Sleep. Fire. Cleansing. What's the cleansing of? Is it the cleansing of the body? I don't think so. I think it's cleansing of the soul. Then what? Peace. And rest. Rest. What does rest imply? If you've ever been awake for a really long time, it's, it's when you get up after that long sleep and you just feel relaxed. Okay? It's the requiescat in pacum. Rest in peace. She takes a sword. We're told, page 65. She thrusts it through the melted snow into the dark earth beneath. It stuck fast, upright. Well, we have it right there. The hilt casting a shadow like a cross upon the ashes. Like the baptismal mark 
that was put on their heads. Now, I have no idea, and I've looked, I have not been able to find anything about Garth Nix's quote-unquote religious ideas or affiliation. As far as I know, he doesn't have one. But, like Lloyd Alexander does, he uses an awful lot of Christian symbolism. Okay? In fact, if I remember correctly, Alexander says he's not a Christian, but he uses the Christian symbolism because it's so powerful, and it still resonates, even in a post-Christian society. Okay? So she goes on. She feels more death. And she knows, page 67, somewhere ahead, there's more dead people. Page 69, she finds the rest of the patrol hacked to pieces. And somebody taking their heads away. Why? Almost a guarantee that their spirits would return. Because even if she were to do what she did to that first soldier, now, she can't send them all the way into death. The implication is the body has to be whole in order, in order for her to do that. If you know anything about, you know, vampires, as an example. We think vampires are a modern creation of Bram Stoker. No. The idea about vampires, the, the notion that there are such things as vampires, goes back at least 2,000 years. Because we have found examples of vampire burials in ancient Roman cemeteries. People literally with wooden stakes through where the heart would be. Okay, Or in some instances, heads remove, because that was supposed to be another way to make sure a vampire stays dead, remove the head. Okay? Sometimes putting silver in the mouth, so you have bodies with stakes and a silver coin in the mouth. Okay? Supposed to keep the spirit inside. A variety of other things. A lot of these, um, and later than the Romans, found in Eastern Europe, like places like Bulgaria, Romania, and they still, people literally still believe in vampirism in those um, places, okay? So, she goes on, uh, we find out, you know, what those decapitated people could become, page 70, hands and such, and 72, 73, she realizes, when she kind of calls a spirit for it, that there is a greater dead back from the dead. One of the greater dead, page 72. It came behind us almost from the wall. We couldn't turn back. It has servants, hands, a mordicant. This is Sergeant Garin. Tell Colonel. So she's thinking, okay, great. One of the greater dead back in life. We don't know what the greater dead is at this point. But we do hear something in that prologue at the very beginning. When Amporson goes into death, what does he do? He speaks with somebody. Caragor. And Amporson says, I sent you to the 8th gate. And he says, yeah, but you didn't send me all the way. And you can't send me all the way. Why? Because there's something keeping him alive. That is, something keeping him from going all the way on. And Sabriel thinks, page 73, it's something to do with this greater dead that has to do with her father. Okay, Let's skip a bunch. She gets to the broken charter stone. And finds, you know, a charter mage had been sacrificed there. Sacrificed by a necromancer, page 77, to give access to life. Or to help a dead spirit break through into life. See, the necromancers can't just go into the dead and call somebody for it. They've got to do something. They've got to sacrifice, kill somebody else, to
to use their life's force to bring that person back. Okay? Um, let's see. Pages 80 and following. So she starts to make the marks. And she goes through the bells. And now we're told what the bells are and what their names are. Bottom of page 80. We have the first bell mentioned. Rana. Okay, so she's put her sword away. She's taken off her gloves. And she's got the bandolier like this and with the bells on it. And she starts with the smallest one. Rana. Rana the sleep bringer, the sweet low sound that brought silence in its wake. Okay, she goes to the next bell. Mosrael, the waker. So you have one that causes sleep, you have one that brings people awake out of sleep. The bell Sabriel should never use, the bell whose sound was a seesaw, throwing the ringer further into death as it brought the listener into life. So you ring that bell, you go farther and farther into death, while the person who hears it in death, not somebody sleeping on the ground, comes back farther and farther into life. Kibeth, the walker. It could give freedom of movement to one of the dead or walk them through the next gate. That is, beyond. Dirim, or Dirim. The voice that the dead so often lost. But Dyram could also still a tongue that moved too freely. In other words, you can use that one to shut people up. Belgayer. Another tricky bell. Belgayer was the thinking bell, the bell most necromancers scorned to use. It could restore independent thought, memory, and all the patterns of a living person. But why would a necromancer not want to use that? You're bringing somebody out of the dead. Why are you doing that? To use them. They become a slave. Do you want thinking slaves? No. You don't want slaves to think. You want them merely to do your will. What would happen if the cauldron born could actually think and had wills of their own? Well, they may not want to fight. Okay? Sereneth. The deepest, lowest bell. Sound of strength. Sereneth was the binder, the bell that shackled the dead to the wielder's will. So you bring somebody out, and then you use Sereneth, and that means that spirit being does whatever you desire. And lastly, Asterael, the sorrowful. Asterael was the banisher, the final bell. Properly rung, it cast Everyone who heard it, far into death, including the ringer. Now, far into death doesn't mean past the ninth gate, but it might mean <coughs> past the eighth gate. Okay. So, she pulls out Saranath, the bell that shackled the dead to the wielder's will. She bows her head, she prepares to go into death, and we're told, unseen by Sabriel, the inscription on the bell began. I was made for Abhorson to slay those already dead. And now it continues, that is, the inscription goes on. The Clare saw me, we have no idea who the Clare are yet. The wall maker made me, we don't know who that is yet. The king quenched me, Abhorson wields me. Okay, so let's see here. She goes into death. We've only got a minute left. Um, she speaks to her mother, and her mother tells her how to get to Ab Horson's house. Um, Sabriel kind of stops the Mordecant, page 95. He tells her he will tell the servants of Caragor 
curse you, etc. She goes on, and we're skipping, obviously, and we're going to stop here. Um, yeah. And we'll stop there. Like I said, I'll post, um, I think it's, I think it's two. Two video lectures to finish Sabriel. So for Monday, when we come back from spring break, have, I'm pretty sure the next Liriel's about the same length, have approximately um, 125, 150 pages read, whatever a fourth of the book is. Break it evenly in a chapter, though. Have a good break. Hopefully you're going somewhere warm.